Good, af good afternoon, ladies and gents. Um, I'm just going to hang on for a mo or two, you know, so the throng can come in. Uh, but can I just do a quick survey? Uh, sorry, my name's Earl Mardle. I'm the chair of 2020 Communications Trust in Auckland, uh, Wellington, Christchurch, Dunedin, and parts north, south, east, and west. Um, I want to do a quick survey. Uh, who's here is the IT person from their organisation? <laughs> right. Uh, anybody here from governance? Anybody here from management? Uh, as, uh, as well, okay. So you're an accidental IT. Oh God, I have to do it. Um, uh, and and uh, from the coalface, the dog's bodies, the general workers. Okay. All right. Um, so here's, here's the subject of, that I want to talk about this afternoon. And hopefully I'll get through it quickly enough so that at the end you can um, help me out. Um, I do not profess to know everything. I do not profess to know even most things. All I can do is um, see if I can provoke uh, some of you guys to criticize, correct, and, um, and improve what I have to say. However, uh, I am not only the chair of the trust, I was the founder of it back in 1996. And for that whole period of time, we've been promoting the use of information technology. So you might guess that I'm fairly keen on it. In fact, I think it's the best idea that we've had since we invented language. And on an individual basis, we really have piled in with gusto. Uh, already nearly three quarters of the world's population is connected one way or another, if only by cell phone. Um, in New Zealand, population 64 million, of uh, whom half of the human population anyway, or nearly half of the human population has um, not just an internet connection, but a trade me account, which is like eBay, but better. Uh, we, we go online to do our banking. We organize our social and family lives on Facebook. So we are keen on this, and it happens across the world. Everybody seems to be very happy to use this technology. And yet when we walk through the doors of our institutions, be they government or business or, in our case, not-for-profits, We suck. Sometimes we suck big, sometimes we suck small, but actually we're not very good at it at all. Uh, in New Zealand we do a, a fairly regular sort of survey on not-for-profit not use of information technology. This is the most recent one. And Ted Zorn and, and Margaret Richardson, who do it at the University of Waikato, do a regular survey to bring you up to date. What is our baseline? How far have we come? How well are we doing? And they can tell you the first two very easily. How well are we doing is, is a sobering kind of thing. The good news is that we're not alone. Uh, the EU has poured hundreds of millions of dollars into e-governance, e-this, e-that, e-the other. And this recent report from uh, last year, 30th of April last year, said, eh, actually, we're not doing as well as we thought we, we could. Uh, on this side of the Tasman, uh, Andrew Ma from, uh, from InfoExchange released a report late last year at, a, at an event in Auckland. And the key finding that I think came out of that report is that competent use of IT in nonprofits is the exception. Now, he's not talking about exceptional use, uh, innovative use, effective use. He is only talking about competent use. And that, after 15 years of this being in the public domain, uh, is really not good enough. So the question that I keep asking is, why is it that when it comes to our information technology programs and activities, we very often end up with one of these, when what we really need is one of these, or one of these, or God help me, one of these. So we have quite a few of these. <laughs> followed by recriminations and bad language and a hunt for scapegoats. Now the next bit of good news is that there's no point hunting for scapegoats. They're not there. It's a waste of your time and energy. And what I'd rather you do is read this book, which was uh, published a few years ago from the University of Otago. Um, and these guys had a look at why it is that so many, in this case, New Zealand government IT programs turned into train wrecks, very expensive train wrecks. And they came up with some conclusions. Uh, by the way, it's worth reading simply to have a look at how a large organization makes really bad decisions, regardless of whether or not it's an information technology. But 
they came up with a sort of rule of thumb, which goes something like this. The nearer to $10 million runs the cost of your IT program, the nearer to 100% is the probability that it will fail significantly in some vital way. It'll be grossly over budget, it'll be hugely late, it'll be magnificently underperforming, or if you get all those right, nobody will want to use it. And what's more, you don't have to get to 10 million bucks. That's where it becomes certain. The failures start from pretty much the first dollar you spend. Now, some uh, more new, oops, let's go back. Some more good news, it's still happening. Uh, we just amalgamated a whole bunch of cities in Auckland, uh, or, or around Auckland, into the Auckland super city. Uh, so they said, okay, we're gonna have to integrate our computer systems. And the politicians, so, okay, said, it's gonna cost us 126 million bucks. Now this happened in October last year, and already the projection is we're up to $576 million. I'm not even taking bets on whether that's going to be the final figure. <clears throat> but it happens everywhere. It's not just not profit, and it's not just government. This report came from IAG earlier this year, and they looked at over 100 uh, companies in the US, and they looked at, okay, they were initially looking at uh, the role of uh, business requirements on whether or not uh, their IT programs were a success. The programs were over 250,000, so a few of us will have those kind of uh, experiences. And they're looking for significant new functionality for their organization. The average size of the project was three million bucks. This is what they discovered. For 68% of the companies that they looked at, success was pure chance. Nothing that they did actually contributed to whether or not it was a successful one. More importantly for the rest of us, 50% of those projects were what they call runaways. They had two at least of these problems. 180% of, of target time, 160% of budget, and under 70% of the required functionality. Now, pretty much in any other field, that will get you hanged, drawn, and quartered. Uh, and it certainly should get you fired. And yet it happens all the time in this field. Um, now, while I said there's no scapegoats, Nevertheless, we all try to find somebody to blame, and here are what I think are of as the usual suspects. What I'd like to do is have a look at those, because from an organizational perspective, I want to look at why they aren't to blame. So let's go through it. <laughs> they sold us something that we don't need and we can't use. Well, setting aside for a moment that our entire economy is based on people selling us stuff that we don't need and can't use, what I think probably happens in most of these uh, in most of these occasions, is the two people sit down in a room and they both ask each other questions that the other one doesn't understand. And then they give answers that the other one doesn't come, uh, understand. And then they come to an agreement that they don't actually share. And it all goes downhill from there. Now there's the odd dodgy salesperson, but in fact, the whole set of relationships around that is going to contribute to why these things happen. And here's an interesting sample. Um, SAP uh, got together with a waste management uh, company over an ERP system. Now that sounds to me like a, a, a prospect for disaster in any case. Waste management said, SAP used a fake product demonstration. All right. And SAP said of, of uh, waste management, well, actually, you didn't tell us really what you really wanted, because probably you didn't know. And by the way, the people in that room didn't have the authority and the understanding to make good decisions. Now, there's a court case going on. I have no idea how that'll, that'll come out, because somebody has to be to blame and somebody has to pay, and it's expensive. But it's a perfect example of what I've been talking about. <laughs> now then, there's our processes. Maybe if we had a better process, or if we followed it more carefully, or, or we had best practice in the following the processes or whatever, maybe these things wouldn't happen. Well, the obvious fact is that for many, many of the most disastrous of such activities, it happens in organizations that are absolute sticklers for process. Because process can help you deliver a particular outcome perfectly, but it can't tell you that it was a dumb idea in the first place. And here's a little sample. Um, uh, New South Wales Emergency Department's first net system. It's crippled by its design flaws. From the very beginning, it was going to be a bad idea. And I'll look later at how we get at that and maybe how we can get around that. <coughs> Our staff. 
and I'm sure all of us have seen some version of this. They're afraid of innovation. They don't like us leading them in new directions. Rubbish. They're perfectly good at innovating. They're afraid of losing their jobs. And now along comes Hooray Henry with this great idea about how they're going to take a, a task that they've been able to do manually perfectly well for a very long time, and they're going to have to do it in a completely new way with a completely new set of tools on a device that they're not really confident in using. And they're afraid that they're going to screw it up and they're going to get fired and they're going to lose their job and they can't pay for their mortgage and they'll lose their marriage and they might as well just jump off a cliff right now. Oh, and by the way, so many of these things have failed in the past. Why should we have some confidence? And one more thing. They have a sneaking suspicion that part of the reason for doing this is so they can be fired because we're so much more efficient. So expecting them to leap in the deep end is, is asking a little bit much. I don't blame them. And here's a good example. <laughs> Herman Miller Furniture, top line furniture company in the US, were actually really early adopters of this stuff. They had great uh, on-site laptop based tools for um, enabling companies to order the right furniture, to lay it all out. They had cute little icons and, and 3D images and all this kind of stuff. They did a lot of work. So they could go through the whole design, layout, product spec, all of this kind of stuff and do it all over the phone. Everybody was impressed. Somebody behind the scenes said, well, we're getting all this information, but we really don't understand why it is that these companies are dealing with this. We know what they do, we know what they buy, but we don't really understand why they buy it, and especially why they buy it from us. How about we collect a whole lot more information through our sales teams uh, so that we can have what was going to be a very early uh, CRM system? And the response from that was something like this. There were two groups of people in this audience. One of them were the salespeople who went, hang on, if we hand over all of that IP to you, then we become fungible. And we like you, but we don't trust you that much. Uh, the other group of, of people in this audience were the lawyers who were saying, actually, you know, we don't really necessarily want to know every gritty detail about all of the relationships between us and our customers. Because some of them include things like, don't send a female salesperson along to this company because he hits on them. That kind of stuff we really don't want to know, but it's actually important to have within your company. You just don't want it recorded. You don't want it discoverable. <laughs> then there's uh, most of you guys. Paranoid empire builders. Well, I want to, be, I want to defend you. Um, I don't think you've got time to do that because you spend half of your lives trying to stop some idiot with a thumb drive full of viruses, plugging it into your network, and then fixing the mess afterwards. You're also trying to stretch shrinking budgets over ever bigger demands. And for the 30th time this month, training the chief executive how to attach a document to an email. <laughs> See, every time I say that, there's laughing from the IT people. Why is this still true? Surely we should have got past this by now. <laughs> okay, let's look at the chief exec. One of the questions that Ted and Margaret um, put to the nonprofit uh, organizations in New Zealand is, or one of the proposals is, that our decision makers have a high level of knowledge of information and communications technology. In 2005, the answer was 33.4% said, yep, that's us. By 2008, it had gone to 36.3%. 36 At this rate, in 50 years, we'll all be up to speed. I don't think we can afford to wait that long. Here's another one. <laughs> our, our key decision makers level of knowledge, uh, level of leadership rather, uh, in using ICT comes out at about 33%. That's certainly not good enough to make good decisions in this area. But the question for all of us is, how are we going to get those people from where they are now to where they need to be? Because it's my contention that it's not something like passing an exam. It's a lot more like riding a bicycle. And how can we enable these people to make decisions, better decisions, and to fail from time to time without causing an awful lot of disruption in our organizations? Because <laughs> here's another bit. When we talk about innovation, we talk about the successes of innovation. But the vast majority of innovations fail. And until we accept that as organizations, then buying into the whole innovation thing is also asking us for some trouble. And in our area, in ICT, there's plenty of that to go around. <laughs> These guys are my heroes, or one group of heroes um, that I'm uh, promoting at the, at the moment. The Charities Commission <laughs> decided to put all their stuff online. 
so that you can register, you can update your, your uh, board members or trustees or whatever, you file your, uh, your annual accounts, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so they allowed $3 million for the project and they were $1.5 million into it and they said to one of the developers, look, some organizations have to file within 30 days, but actually some of them have to file within 90 days. Can we change that three to a nine, please? And the developers said, yeah, sure. To change that one digit will cost you 15,000 bucks. At which point the Charities Commission, to their huge credit, went, damn, or words to that effect. We have got this seriously wrong. They slammed on the brakes, they threw the whole thing out, and they went back and started from scratch. The whole one and a half million dollars went down the drain, they started again. In the end, it only cost them a million bucks, so they saved half a million dollars. Having an organization that is able to make that quality of decision when it has gone wrong would be a really good thing for all of us. <laughs> this one, of course, gets the blame. Ah, it's the damn computer. It's, the computer has whatever. How often have we heard it? And yet, what have we got? A computer is an obedient servant. In fact, it's a fanatically obedient servant. You tell it to do something, it will do it exactly. Now, if you have a manual system and there's something that's not quite right, then transaction by transaction by transaction, the human being attached to that manual system will make the adjustment. Probably not even notice it after a little while, almost certainly won't bother telling somebody. You take that little error and you put it into a system, an accounting system, an ERP system, a CRM, whatever it may be, and your computer will iterate it a million times in half a minute and you've got a huge problem out of something that wasn't there before. So getting that stuff right is really important. But how do we get there? The other thing is that speed matters. You plug this stuff into an organization and the speed of things changes radically. And speed changes the character of the things that it touches. A jumbo jet at 80 k's is just a big building on the move. At 280 k's it turns into a bird. Its whole character changes. This is what happens to organizations that connect themselves with information technology. But whether you turn into an eagle or a sparrow or a dodo is very, very hard to predict. The other thing it does is it amplifies everything about your organization. It amplifies the good, it amplifies the bad. And you cannot control what it amplifies or when or by how much. So when we embark upon these programs, we have to be aware of all of these possibilities that may come and bite us in the butt. And we need to have organizations both top to bottom, uh, or to yes, from top to bottom, that can cope with those possibilities. Here's a little one that I picked up from, uh, from New South Wales a little while ago. Uh, Alan Ficketer, who's at the University of Sydney. Failures at the bank and stock exchange were to be expected. Now, if it's going to happen up there, at that altitude, then please can we just give ourselves a bit more leeway at the bottom and not be, so, uh, not be so angry when it happens to us. So what about your board? What about governance? Because the interesting thing about boards and committees and all that kind of stuff is that they are locuses of, loki of power and authority. And you gain power and you manage power and authority by initially being able to control access to and use of, even knowledge of, information. And as soon as you plug this technology into your organization, you lose control of your information and you distribute your power. And that's something that gives boards heartache for any number of perfectly good reasons. And when it happens, they are likely to behave badly. So we need to start at the top. And that's why I'm, I'm hoping that more and more board people will actually be in sessions like this, because they're the ones we really need. I mean, you IT guys uh, know all this stuff, I think, from, from the bottom. But that's uh, a, an important place that we need to work. Because we live in a WikiLeaks world. And it happens everywhere. The, the, uh, um, the Australian defense people are going through this right, at, right now, are, are they not? You know? uh, a woman is, is sexually attacked. The defense force doesn't deal with it. She goes on Facebook, and the world knows about it. Uh, it's not going to go away. And once again, innovation means disruption of power structures and processes. So we need to educate our governance structures about 
what this means for them and maybe get them thinking different ways about how they're going to manage their, their work. <laughs> this one uh, is the last one from the list of usual suspects uh, and it com comes from age concern in, uh, in New Zealand. They got some nice money from a government department who wanted to help them manage their information. So they went through this whole process and the only people it helps is the government department. It's just a load on their organisation. And now they're trying to retrofit something that'll help their staff. And that's uh, a lot more expensive and a lot more disruptive. So a lot of people get to this point. Damn it, we'd be better off if we just stuck with this stuff, wouldn't we? Actually, part of the problem is that we are spending too much of our time and, uh, and energy trying to rein in this technology so that it doesn't do anything more than this. And that's not a luxury we have anymore. We've got an enormous amount of power sitting on the desk and we need to use it because we're uh, in straightened times, we're getting more and more people who demand our services and we can't just treat it as if it's nothing more than uh, a phone, a typewriter, a photocopier and a large book of stats. And the reality is that in the world we live in, there is no going back. Uh, and it hasn't been for a long time. When I first set up the trust in 1996, I went to a school called Island Bay in Wellington. And a nice lady in a smock covered in paint stood in front of a bunch of us and, and talked about how they were going to use, uh, or how they are using, computers in their library and their classroom. And at the end of it, somebody at the back went, yes, but what are the educational outcomes of using this technology in your school? And the nice lady in the smock gave him a look that said, you're not an Australian, are you? Um, and she said, what are the educational outcomes of using electric lights instead of candles? It's just the way we do things now. And that's the other thing about this. Can we just shrink this down a little? Can we just say it's just the way we do things now and that we don't have to get all hit up and, and twisted and strange about it? So <laughs> I think we need to redefine the problem somewhat. Uh, and the first thing I want to do is, let's forget about the technology, let's look at the organisation. I say that every organisation is virtual. It exists in its information and in its information alone. There's nothing else. And when you look at the things that we can change about it, without changing it, they're really quite significant. We can change all of these things and yet somebody who was working with our organisation before they changed and working after that they changed can still say, I've worked for this organization for a long time. So what exactly, if we change all this, is the organization? Well, actually, it's a little kernel, which is who we are, what we do, why we're here, how we do things. Those are really the things about us that really, really matter. Everything else is description and, and support, but those are the things that matter. And if we can work with those rather than try and get overwhelmed by this, the rest of the information that we're surrounded by, then maybe we can make some progress. <clears throat> and we instantiate that information in a whole bunch of documents, which, as we try to shift them into a digital, uh, digital mode, can get in the way, and we'll look at that a bit later. But I say this, every organisation is, is information, and this is how it operates. It's the glue that keeps us together, it's the lubricant that lets us m move, it's the fuel that drives us along, it's the DNA that gives us our structure. It is so important to the existence of the organisation. Now, you start fiddling with that, and in essence what you're doing is undertaking brain surgery on yourself. It's not trivial. So, you might want to have some uh, instruction manuals before you start opening up the skull. I recommend these guys. They worked at the Palo Alto Research Center with Xerox. And <clears throat> they looked at the role and process of information in their organization. Just as a slight side issue, uh, one of the things they discovered was that even within Xerox, which is a pretty disciplined organization, they could not transfer best practice from one building to another building across a road in California because the institutional and organizational dynamics in one building were completely different from the one across the road, that they couldn't do it. However, they found something very, very important about all this stuff. They said, this actually is how our organization works and how every organization works by the widespread, consistent, culturally communicated, informal breaking of the rules. Where the rules are all there, 
but they don't get used. And I'll give you the perfect example of that. Remember these guys? Let me show you their business plan. Practically every line in that plan is a criminal offence, as we eventually discover. Do you imagine that it was written down anywhere? Of course not. But everybody who worked inside Enron knew, this is what we do, this is how we do it, as we eventually discovered. Now, setting aside the criminal intent for a moment, I'm saying that's exactly how all of us work. <laughs> and then we come along with an ICT system which locks in the rules. You, take a, you get your developer, you say, here's our manuals, our practices, processes, risk matrices, all that kind of stuff. Here, stick them into code. Because that makes sure that we, we, we check off all the boxes as we, as we go through our processes. Now, the unions have known about this for a very long time. You don't go on strike, because you don't get paid if you go on strike. So what do you do? If you want to cripple an organisation, if you want to apply pressure, what do you do? You know. Sorry? You work to rule. Damn, we just spent $10 million forcing our entire organization to work to rule. No wonder it's all going to hell in a handbasket. Here's somebody else you need to know about. Karen Stevenson, uh, some years ago, uh, did the academic version of what the guys at, at Xerox did. And she came to pretty much the same conclusion. She said, all our organization charts, our lines of authority, all, all that kind of stuff, they tell us about our structure, but they don't tell us about our process. They don't talk about the work that we're doing in fact, and they don't talk about how things really get done. This, this is amazing. There is very little working knowledge in our formal rules, procedures, or policies. What she said, however, is the ropes. They exist, and they're real. When somebody comes into your organization, you give them the manuals and all the policies and so forth, you get them to sign off, then you give them a mentor who says, now let me show you the ropes, i.e., this is how this organization really works. And the ropes are really important because actually you all recognize this. If you want something done, do you fill out the form or do you find Mary in accounts? Right? Of course you do. And that's why the, uh, the best practice wouldn't transfer from one building to another because it's a body of tacit knowledge that depends on the relationships within the organization. And when you shift the organization or when you change the people in that organization, that body of tacit knowledge itself changes. <laughs> Tonya Sermon from the States um, also talked about, talks about how physical closeness is a really important part of the way organizations work. So when people are close together, they work together well or ill, but they do work together, and that physical closeness is important. That makes it very difficult when you've got a highly distributed organization. You have to take account of the fact that, uh, that people can't just switch that on and off. And that's why getting together in the same space is actually a good idea. <laughs> but what do you find in this map of the ropes? Well, she says, those cultural carriers are inconsequential to hierarchy very often. The other bit of news is that where hierarchy gets in the way, they just root around it, okay? But there are three types of people generally, and if you've got an organization of more than about 20 people, you've got these guys in there. The hubs connect people together. They work together with physical closeness with those, with those people. They solve problems, they mediate disputes, all that kind of stuff. Then there are the gatekeepers who connect different parts of your organization together. Now, once upon a time, they were the tea ladies and the post boys. And guess what we did to the tea ladies and the post boys? Guess who your current gatekeeper is in your organization? Actually, it's a lot of people in this room. They're your IT support people. They go from one part of the building and one part of the organization to another, solving problems, seeing who's having the same kind of problems. You better hope they're good communicators and not those uh, traditional geeks who go, <laughs> have a sort of deep focus. But it's really important that they, that they understand what they're doing. And these, the, the last ones are the worst of all. They're the hardest of the lot. Because they don't take part in the work process necessarily. They hold the institutional memory. And they give or withhold approval for what's going on. Now, if you've got all of these people on your side, if you go through the right processes and you have them all on your side, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to succeed because it still might have been a dumb idea. But if you don't have those people involved and on your side and participating uh, uh, positively, then you really are in trouble. So I'd like to restate the problem yet again. 
<laughs> this is how most of us see our organizations, a mechanism designed to perform a task. And hopefully a well-oiled, efficient, powerful uh, mechanism, but nevertheless a mechanism. And going back to the whole thing about doing brain surgery on yourself, trying to change the deep internals of something like this while it's still going is crazy. You can't change the spark plugs on one of these things while it's, it's running at full power. So, our whole conception of what we are doing and how we work needs to change as well. And what I want to offer is this. Who can see the old lady? Yeah. Who can see the young lady? Who can choose which lady they see? Who can tell me where the lady is? Hmm? Where's the lady? Any one of them. Where's the lady? She's in here. She's not up there. Now that's just a bunch of marks on a screen. It could just as easily be a description of your organization. And the task that we really have as organizations is that we have to shift the way we see ourselves from the old lady who's got stamps and photocopiers and telephones and typewriters to the young lady who is a networked, connected, Facebook using, texting, person and a community in which she lives. All right, so, fine. Image. What does it mean in practice? What are the kinds of things that we need to do? Well, here's some suggestions that I have, and feel free to add, subtract, or divide. <laughs> Those, I think, are really important, and I think I can show why. The first thing I do, whoops, let's, no, go back one. Mapping the present. Okay. So, using Karen Stevenson's ideas, have a look at your organization. Find out how information flows within it, who those key people are, and, and how they're, they're working. Yes, of course you need an organization chart, but those key people, those cultural carriers, are vital. And how does information flow? And don't just talk about your own organization, obviously. You are, you are now in a whole information environment, and there are holes, there are gaps, uh, information filters in and out. You're never going to stop it. The question is, are you aware of it, where it's coming from, and, and how you can be even more aware of it. That's pretty much about it, uh, the awareness of that. <laughs> and this, just for the hell of it, is my own organization. We're not a big one. But I tried to map the kinds of things, uh, the kind of relationships that we have. So there's a bunch of trustees. We don't have a chief executive, so we have a, an admin committee. Uh, so there's a, the blue line is uh, responsibility and reporting between the trustees and the admin committee. The green lines are uh, collaborative communications among, uh, between people. Uh, the red lines are flows of funds. We have a project manager, project director who takes care of our various projects. So we have to, uh, first of all, we have to pay him. Actually, there's a green line missing because we have to collaborate uh, with him on a, on a, f a fairly intimate sort of basis. Um, he has to stay in, in good touch with our projects, but our treasurer, who's the red dot at the top there, he's a total maniac. He's always out there in the world, out in the net, looking for things that we might do. Uh, and so he feeds a huge amount of information into our trustees. But individual trustees are also out there doing that. And some of them have direct relationships with our, with our um, uh, programs. And some of us also have direct relationships with our partners and potential partners. So this is something like how our organization looks to me. doesn't mean it look like, looks like that to everybody. But if we can get away from the traditional structures and start breaking the way we think about organizations, maybe we'll have a better idea about how we should reconnect them electronically. <coughs> then do the IAG check. You get to the, to the point where you're about to commit for your, I, your IT project, and you've got, you've got uh, budgets and timelines and, and deliverables and all that kind of stuff. Run this across it and say, okay, but if it's 180% of the time, or 160% of the budget, or only delivers 70% of what we expected, is it still a good idea? And can we live with that? That might just give you an extra moment to go back and have another look at it. <laughs> the other thing is, and this sort of smacks of coercion, uh, and I'm, I don't really mean it to, but if things are not in the critical path of people's activities for the day, and they can choose not to do it, especially if it is something new, especially if it is something difficult, then they won't. It's human nature. So, in the 1980s, a um, famous Prime Minister of New Zealand called Rob Muldoon, who's, uh, who's 
probably most infamous trans-Tasman gaffe was to suggest that every New Zealander who came to Australia increased the average intelligence of both countries. Um, he was getting annoyed with the doll cues being on the TV and on the news. So what he said was, okay, from now on, everybody who's on the doll will have their money paid into their bank account. And a whole lot of people who didn't have bank accounts, used to get the money in cash, suddenly got bank accounts because that was the only way they were going to get their, their doll money. So what he did was put a bank in a critical path for people for whom it never was before, and they, they duly complied. The side effect, of course, was that you can now no longer photograph the doll cues in New Zealand, and there's no compelling images to go on the TV and the news. Same happens with panel beaters in New Zealand. If you want to work with the insurance companies, you log into their website and you, run, you, you provide your tenders for their, for their work. So a whole bunch of hairy guys who bash tin now have computers and internet connections and, and a browser, even if the home page is only the, the, the tendering sites for the, for the um, uh, insurance companies. Because it's in their critical path. Otherwise, they don't stay in business. Walmart did the same with all their suppliers. They said, you want to do business with us? This is how you do it. It's electronic. It's online. And <laughs> perhaps a little more relevant was, is um, New York City, which had its online program going in the mid-late 90s. Ed Koch was the mayor. And things were not going well, so he called all his managers in and he said, guys, we're going to make New York Online really, really work. And I know we're gonna, uh, going to achieve that because every month you are going to report to me the progress that your division has made in bringing New York City Online into fruition. And by the way, it's on your annual report and your bonus will depend on it. So if we just apply a little pressure in our organization sometimes, um, uh, then, maybe, then maybe that can be, can be done. But more importantly, I think, is if people have the option, then they will take that option, especially if that option is familiar. <clears throat> the next thing is my, my current hero organization. The Citizens Advice Bureau decided that they wanted to put their system online because they had folders and files and, and paper all over the place and somebody would come in and yes I think there's something in here and they'd be going through files. It was just ridiculous. It was a, an awful lot of work and they're volunteers uh, so it was using up a lot of time just filing. So they said we're going to take all this stuff and we're going to put it online across the country and by the way we're going to make it available to the, to the public as well so they can have a look at this. Interestingly enough, remember I talked about um, staff and being afraid of losing their job, the very first thing that the volunteers said was, does this mean we're going to lose our jobs? It's the very first thing that they thought of. But <laughs> they have 90 branches all around the country. So they said, okay, we're citizens of advice, we know what we do, let's get on with this thing. The first thing they asked was, what do we do? It took six months for them to agree on what they do. And then they moved on to, how do we do it? And more and more time was used up. From the beginning of the decision that we'll put our stuff online, to the launch of the website, anybody got any clues how long it took them? Three years? Exactly. Spot on. Three years. Because they didn't worry about the technology. What they worried about was their organization bringing their community of users and participants along with them. Everybody got a say about what was going to happen and how it was going to happen. And they had volunteer teams of reality checkers. So they would get to one part of the process and they'd, they'd hand it over to them and say, this is what we've got. And the reality checkers would say, now that's never going to work, but that's not bad if you. And that's not going to work either. And, and the important thing was that having had that reality check, they took it away and they fixed it. Being taken seriously is one of the most important things that you can do for the people in your organization. If you're not taken, taking them seriously, then why would they bother? And sorry, but consultation has had such a bad name because too many people have used it to say, we've consulted you. We'll now do what we plan to anyway, but shut up because we asked you and you said. Well, that doesn't cut it. And it especially doesn't cut it in this kind of, uh, 
uh, environment. And your dissenters are a key resource. They really are. Because right now they're risking their job to tell you you've got it wrong. Please listen to them and deal with their, uh, their objections rather than simply uh, trying to shut them up or dismiss them. Okay? Making a difference really, really matters. Now, the other thing is, of course, that they had to get eventually to a stage where they said, all right, now we need to, to check our staff and see who is able to use it. What is your, the status of your um, ICT capability? And there were a few, a dozen or so people around the country who went, no, I really, really can't deal with this. And they, they moved out. But everybody else either could do it or got the training to do it. And it's working. Uh, not only is it working well, they're handling more inquiries than ever before. And when the government, for example, wanted to know how many, not only how many people from Christchurch after the earthquake wanted to know stuff from the Citizens Advice Bureau, but what kinds of questions they were asking, CAB could provide it like that. Uh, the other day they were quoting, uh, this year, they, in the last year, they have done 693,273 inquiries as of last Friday at 4 p.m. Uh, being able to, to provide that is great, but without a system that's working for a staff that is working, they could never have done so. So, <clears throat> and one more thing is the modular approach. Please, let's not try and do it all at once. Wherever possible, let's do it a piece at a time so that we get familiar with it. And this, uh, this is perhaps a case for uh, something like cloud computing, where you can pay for a small part of the service and then realize that you need a bit more and need a bit more and need a bit more. Um, there are other issues that I think uh, with, with cloud computing, but uh, it's, it's worthwhile thinking about it. So place small bets that you can afford to lose, that you can afford to go back and iterate. Um, remember that we still have the privilege of being able to fail, but we really can only fail in small amounts. Uh, none of us have the kind of money that we can, we, that we can go with uh, the kind of uh, decision that was made at the, at the Charities Commission. And it's never finished. Never feel that it's finished. It's always a work in progress. This technology uh, continues to change, and we're going to have to change with it. So that's what I really want to say. There are three groups of, of participants in this. There's, there's, first of all, there's technology. And the thing about the technology is that it's constantly evolving and obsolescing, I think, if it's a word, right? So whatever we're using today, We'll change it. It's going to be changed. Being able to let legacy stuff go uh, rather than get stuck with it is very important uh, for an organization. Then there's the people. Well, see, we're, we're, we're fine as individuals. We're curious. We're adaptable. We take risks. We do silly stuff. We're, we get involved in this, in this kind of thing. You know, the, um, I, I, um, I connect with my daughter on Facebook pretty much the only way, along with my nieces and nephews. And, and uh, the only person I can't connect with is my wife because she refuses to have a Facebook account. And that, that's, but she can't text either, so you know, she is, she's a, a, a real Luddite. Uh, but then we come to our organizations. And our organizations are designed to be stable and durable, which means that change is so much more difficult within them. And this is where I don't know. This is where I really, really don't know uh, how we're going to go from here. Because in my generation, if you want to do something, you identify a need and you set up an organization to perform the task. And in the next generation, you cut that middle piece out. You, organize, you use these tools to organize yourself to get something done. Uh, again, going back to Christchurch. Within 24 hours, 18,000 students had been on a Facebook page to sign up to volunteer to go out and clean the streets. It happened like that. And when the streets were clean, they disappeared. And there was no organization as a noun. There was only organization as an activity. And it happens in, on every scale. The people of Ukraine used text to change the government. Now the people of Tunisia and Egypt and Syria and so forth are using Twitter and Facebook and blogs to change their government. The, the limits of power don't seem to have appeared yet. But how does that match with the organization as a noun? 
and I don't know what the answer is, but I have a feeling that being able to shift from the noun to the verb is actually a serious condition for the continued existence of the organizations that many of us work for. Thank you for your time. <laughs> do, you, <clears throat> do you have anything to say? Please. Have we got, oh, sorry, how much more time have we got, by the way? Plenty? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Everything you said, it's all true. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> You got someone back there? Yeah. Uh, hi, that was a really good talk. Um, my, my background before coming in the not-for-profit sector was um, I implemented CRM systems for 10 years. And the number one thing, I mean, there's a lot of things to take away from that, but the one thing that I learned during that 10 years is the modular approach. It's, it's the only way to... to I think successfully get technology into a business is to go progressively and at small bites. And, um, yeah, right, so, so okay, let's, let's draw on that. Uh, how, what sort of bites did you use? And, and more importantly, how did you sell that idea to, to management? Or where did that come from? Where did the idea come from? Yeah, I, very similar to yourself. I, I would typically use examples of, of the big bang or going for big projects, how that would fail. But um, largely mapping out the, the, the current state and, and trying to come up with a roadmap to, it, uh, to introduce enhancements progressively. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it kind of sells itself when you start demonstrating similar organisations that have, that, that, or competitors that you're trying to emulate who have had significant failures by, by going in too fast without clear requirements, mm -hmm. pumping in too much cash. So who are you working for now? I uh, work for Mind Australia, so we're a mental health um, organisation. How good are you at using this technology? Uh, we're working at it. We're, we're um, July 1, we go live from a paper-based system, so we've been on that for 30 years, and we're going live with our first electronic system, and it's very simple. Right. Um, keeping, it, keeping it pretty straightforward. Um, I, I mean, my, my next year, my budget, all of it, almost the, the major stake of it, is now about consolidating and training people, communicating, getting people up to speed, getting interactive, because at the end of the day, the hardest thing I think I face is, I understand technology, it's easy for me to go and put that in an organisation. The hardest thing is, is how do I get the, how do I enable the rest of the organisation to use that technology to assist them? And that's that is such a challenging thing in not-for-profits. Um, we've got, in our organisation, we've got people who have human skills and are very good at those human skills and working with people. So. If I come along with technology, I have to make it easy, and attractive and supportive for them. It has to be intuitive. If I don't get those things right, it's not worth me showing up. Mm -hmm. Did you buy the software or are you, is it, uh, it cloud-based? No, we, we bought it um, from a mob down in Geelong um, at, a, at around a cost of, it'll be under $200,000 mm -hmm. for us. And we're a 500-man organisation with um, 50 sites across South Australia and Victoria. So. It's a, it's a moderate, it's, it's a low investment if you look at it. Um, it's actually, our infrastructure's been the most expensive part, moving into a data centre, setting all those kind of things up. But um, I, th I feel that we've got the blend right where we're doing it progressively. And for us, it's taken us three years to get to this point. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah. Okay, right, anybody else? Um. Um, I got and looked at my my organization where the boy the boy come and me can 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 you you implement something for us to use then I will go away and. Doing something for the board to use, then, then, then end up not using it because they find out that it's difficult or they can't understand. And I'm thinking, you, 
You won't mean to tell me something for you. And in the end, you can't either. How, how do you think people know when you get something that the boy that does not get does not get it at all. What do you do? Okay, okay, I I I have to apologise if I've misunderstood because I found it difficult. Okay. Um, you, you're saying that uh, if I get it correctly, that you you have a problem with your board, which doesn't which doesn't get this stuff and is yeah, getting in the way. They they act me. To do something for them with a doing then in the end they they can they can they won't do it because they can understand the the technology what you do they really get something right in the organization thing at the board, at the board level, they can get the big picture. Okay, I, I, and I don't have an answer. Um, okay. but, I wish I did because, because basically what, I, if, again, if I, can, if I can sort of clarify what I think you're talking about is that, that the that you're doing things right in the organisation. You've got you've got stuff going on in your organisation using this technology, which is which is working pretty well. But but your board doesn't understand what it is, and they're not being supportive. Okay, um, how how do you fix this? I. Yeah, program of selective assassination. Yeah, okay. Um, but short of that, I mean, I I I heard your your uh, explanation earlier on about how you got yourself a new board, and that's one way. But but you know, it's 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 uh, it's difficult, and very often getting a new board is is itself a problem because let's face it, many of them are volunteers, and who wants to volunteer to do this kind of stuff at this kind of level? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, just just to sort of digress slightly, uh, my trust promotes this stuff. Um, I had one of my board members. We run our our, uh, our meetings on a wiki, so the agendas go up and 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 we use uh, Doodle to decide on dates and times and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I had one board member say, "Can you just email that stuff to me?" And I said, "It's up on the wiki." And he said. I don't use wikis. You know, here we are promoting this technology. I don't use wikis. <laughs> you know, uh, it's it's really difficult. Uh, okay, we've we've come to an end. Look, I'm, I'm, uh, if you want to bail me up about about anything later, I would really appreciate it because the more I hear, the more I can uh, the more I can share. But uh, thank you very much for your time. I've uh, I've had a ball, and uh, I hope you've uh, found something useful out of that. Thank you.